friends. There are some punctual people. Hey. NASA, NASA punctual. Who says punk was wasn't cool? <laughs> punctual is cool. Punk is always right on time. Anarcho. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Kemp. How's everyone? Doing great. Doing nice. great. Did you um did you get a chance to to look around at Notion to do any like Gantt type of things? Like it's yeah, clunky, but it's not. It it kind of works. It's like it's yeah. good, but it's it's uh it's clunky. Yeah, I'm learning. Uh, I spent. I definitely spent some time in it yesterday trying to figure out because what I like about it is since we have these two tracks of digital and physical, it's actually really great because I can kind of keep you can prod, you can do these little squares, right? And then you can mm -hmm. tap into them. So I like it for that feature. Um, but yeah, I'm learning all the tricks, like adding photos and the toggles and all of that. It's onboarding to all of these project management tools is feels so like defeated because I'm like, is this worth it? But I'm just going to go with it. Mm -hmm. Feels the same looking at every new machine learning tool is like, is this right. going to be relevant in six months? Is this going to be relevant in two weeks? Totally. I just can't look at another Gantt chart because like it, I like a light gray background with like a navy cobalt blue tab. Like I just can't do it. <laughs> I know you can change those colors, but. Have you asked uh, chat GPT to make you any Gantt charts? No, that's a brilliant idea. Make me a make me a uh, Gantt chart based off of like a Kim Jones Dior color palette thing. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> I had it a couple like project plans. I was like, give me a six month plan in two week increments with five action items for every two weeks. And it wasn't terrible. Yeah, did anyone see the um, the Nike and Tiffany shoe drop that they just did? So they, oh, I'll put it, I'll find the- about it, you'd rather Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. The, the like Tiffany blue box with the Nike check mark. Yeah, exactly. It was like the box was so much better than the actual shoe in my opinion, because it was just like a black shoe with this um, light blue swoosh is what yeah, the, the shoe crazy. ended up being. Felt so lazy, exactly. So lazy. Uh, like, and some fucking I, hardware. This is a jewelry company. And the hardware, like the silver, there was like a silver tab on the back, but it was, my guess is maybe a like a quarter inch by a half inch rectangle on the very back. It was so small. Um, but what I found fascinating was it was one of the first collabs that people really started diving into reposting AI generated pe like people's work, which I thought was really interesting. Not a lot of it, but one person's work went viral for it, which was awful, in my opinion. It was super tacky, but it was just fascinating to see like what happens when you do a really, I'm sure that collab was months in the working, and then all of a sudden this other person's work just went viral. Yeah, but that's the difference is like the design engineering aspect, right? Like you right. can make visuals all day long, but making the physical object, like yep. I think as um, that's one of the biggest challenges right now for like brands and stuff, like how do we bring physicality to this like digital online experience? Cause we don't want to get like sniped right. by people just making AI versions. Totally. Yeah, and how does the physical keep you engaged enough while still maintaining like the practicality of making a shoe is not, yeah. There's a really good YouTube channel called Desi Design Theory. And uh, a few months back, <clears throat> he, um, he in the earlier days of, uh, of Mid Journey, he used it to render a bunch of shoe designs and then he went and um, went through the process of, of actually designing designing it in CAD. I mean, there's a company that's been doing that, like pre-mid journey, uh, Airgan. 
think I posted about them before. Like A-R-E. Air -E. Yeah, I can. A-R-E. Yeah, so I it's know. not that it's not happening. It's that it's maybe not very well marketed or like maybe the designs just aren't that appealing. I don't know. Yeah, Artifact got bought up by Nike for doing exactly that, like making digital, doing digital drops compared with a physical shoe. Um, and they just, you know, they got lucky with it, but yeah. I'll look at ChatGPT for the, for the Gantt chart though. That's a good idea. Speaking of, I think we have a new guest, Benjamin Lucas. Oh, Benjamin's Hello. here? Oh yeah, there he is. Hey. How's it going? It's going good. Hello. Um, would an introduction be appropriate or is that like... It's up to you, uh, my However you want to do you. it. Yeah. I, you know, I just <laughs> like to welcome the, newcomers. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess like I'm kind of designer, technologist sort of person um, who's in between a lot of different things right now. Um, yeah, I used to work in physics. I used to work in neuroscience. Now I'm doing things with media. stuff um so back in like 2012 i got a job on craigslist working for a startup that was making x-rays out of scotch tape in marina del rey as uh, one does as one does yeah i've had only good experiences with craigslist like i've never once had a kidney stolen uh, <laughs> it's been universally positive but basically um uh, it's, it's like static electricity generates a really high charge density um, and you can get to x-ray levels of energy as that field breaks down if you're in a vacuum uh, you need to get rid of all the intervening gases so that the electrons can have a smooth current down um, and so i was joined the startup i had a degree in physics but i joined a startup that was trying to turn this into a novel x-ray source um, basically like finding ways to apply static electricity to generate bright light. And the TLDR is actually that it's a cold fusion pitch, um, but you don't say that in public because then everyone looks like you like you're insane. Um, you have to say scotch tape, then it makes it way worse than Well, if yeah, you say yeah. that it's phase, then it's fine. But then if you're saying they're like- Cold fusion, actually, what are you talking about? Whoa, 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 whoa. no, there's scotch tape. <laughs> <laughs> But like in terms of why you actually get started on this is like it's all it's a cold fusion play, where if you can get the high energy density, then can you fuse deuterium into helium? Maybe. I'm, now I'm with you. Now I'm with you. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's like the lab at UCLA that's doing this is doing all sorts of like it's not cold, it's like alternate fusion. There are a series of euphemisms that you say so you don't get murdered by the NSF. The NSF is popping people nowadays. Well, they just won't fuck you, right. which for a professor is the same thing as being killed. Right. Uh, when you have Reform tenure. Warm fusion. Well, it's still technically hot. It's just a low. <laughs> yeah, right. Low, low temp. <laughs> yeah. Because of the what happened with, with the neuroscience? Um. That was a lab at UCSF I joined also through Craigslist, um, where I never once had any organs stolen from me as well. Um, and that was a computational neuroscience lab that was doing perception of language, whereas uh, it's called ECOG, which is a imaging modality that basically is a set of electrodes on the surface of the brain. Um, and what's so cool about that is it gives you very high time resolution, unlike fMRI, which is kind of garbage, no offense. Um, where like the time delay on fMRI is really long. So you have a lot happen within three seconds in terms of total amount of thinking. Um, so basically like you just have a very high time resolution series, which is important for language where time is very short. Um, and I was basically just doing math help on and like help build experiments to understand 
how sound gets turned into meaning in the brain. Does it have to be like language or other other types of sound too? Um, so this was specifically focused on language. Um, there was some interest in tones and music, but like the group itself was focused on language and also broadly construed because one of the things we had was a person who spoke sign language, uh, which is not part of the acoustic language areas, but like it's processed by the language parts of the brain, which is cool and weird. Um, but of course, the you know the language part and the hand and the and the ear are actually very close in on the cortex. Like language and hands are very close to each other, oddly enough. Um, and they have a lot of just things overlap. Um, but the lab itself is focused mostly on language. And there was things on the acoustics like tones of like, can you recognize rising tones versus falling tones? And can we entrain that in people? Um, obviously, three letter agencies are interested in people speaking tonal languages. Um, and like being able to learn Chinese faster would be kind of cool. There's a yeah, there's a couple of books I'll drop in the chat. This neuroscientist wrote a book about learning music in the '80s, and then followed it up with a book about the hand. So, Word. yeah, good stuff. So, what are you doing yeah. now? I'm sorry, um, I don't ask questions. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, sorry, it's all good. Um, since then, I've basically been doing like hand research stuff, like human factors on hands. Um, and right now I'm actually doing basically like machine learning uh, computer vision project uh, involving just like images, cameras. I've just kind of been on a camera kick recently um, and like cameras as an observational tool. So like this past fall, I got into time-lapse a lot and like studies of different ways of thinking about time-lapse because if you think about time-lapse is just changing our study of time and change. So like, lots of things happen on time scales that are just not human at all. Uh, and time lapse is a way to sort of abridge that gap and change our perception of the world around us and, you know, like see different time scales. Um, and one of the things that actually culminated in was I photographed a tree in the park every day for the fall. Um, and it was just a really positive experience to watch a tree and visit a tree every day. And like beyond any technical things about imaging, like I totally recommend that you find a tree and photograph it every day because it's a really good way to exist and to like have a neighbor that is not human at all, but you care a lot about. Hmm. Um, That's a fictional account of something like that. Um, companion species. Yeah. And it's like, it's your neighbor. Like that tree is, knows a lot about that local space. Like it's been there longer than you. It'll be there after you. It's there when it's raining. It's there when it's snowing. It's like there at all times of year. <clears throat> and so it kind of has to like just adapt to the light and the wind and the rain in this way that's like, it's very attuned to that one little spot on the planet. And once you start to notice that, you just start to notice like, like how the weather moves, how the rain comes, like <clears throat> it's kind of cool. And it's you just develop a weird attachment emotionally to a totally non-human neighbor and your home and you just see your home in a different way um my mind just went to to a, a tree just being like you know what i'm out of here and just walking away <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing though is like this tree in the park i would be so sad if it were to, like anything would happen to it i would actually be like really like what the fuck <laughs> um were it can i just I'm uh, sorry sorry to inter interrupt benjamin um because this happened last time let's let's post chat stuff in the discord because if we do it here, it'll it'll just uh, vaporize once we're once we're done. Um, where do we put those, Dre? Do we have a good? Is there like an office hours channel? Oh, I don't know. I feel like yeah, there there should be an office hours channel. Sorry, Benjamin. No, this is like there was some I'll, good. There's always some good stuff, and then it so disappears. We could yeah. I I'll, I'll let me find oh, there. The there's an, there's an office hours one uh, office hours chat log. Yeah, let's put it in there. It's way down. Is that okay? It's way down it's in, the in, uh, the, in, the in the basement. Should it be in the basement? No, I think it should be higher up. Let me move well, it. Hasn't been used. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. It was going quiet. Let me move it. Uh, uh oh. It's dragged it to my desktop. Mm -hmm. um, I'll recopy. <laughs> 
I'll move it somewhere. I'll move it to front deck somewhere. For the time being. Oh, God. Have it. <laughs> Did I delete it? <laughs> it's at the bottom of front deck. Probably doesn't make sense, but I'll do it for now. Sorry, Benjamin, go on. No, I had nothing. I was just reminiscing on knowing a tree is a really special thing. Yeah. Uh, like time lapse in general is kind of a cool tool to just experience the world on different time scales and different, like, imagine if you lived 100 years. Imagine if you lived 1,000 years. How would that change your perception of the world around you? I, uh, I shoot a lot of time lapse. Uh, uh, I've got a like a 35 mil rig and a, and a cinema camera. So I've done a bunch of like, uh, so I was obsessing with astro lapses for a long time. So I would, I would set up uh, astrophotography time lapses. I, uh, there's a dark sky preserve a few hours north of where I'm at that I go to on new moons occasionally. And, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a place that has like a no blue light allowed. So everything has to be covered in a re red gel. And so doing astro lapses are really, really great because there's that, that, that scale of, uh, of everything happening so quickly. Um, I find that that and, and magnification are two things that I am really attracted to because magnification does another thing where, uh, whether you're throwing a drone really high up in the air and seeing something from from far away, or whether you're going super close into something, and then when you add uh, a time lapse uh, feature to that, or uh, slowing it right down. So I have a camera that does a thousand frames a second, and I've shot on cameras that do a hundred thousand frames a second. Uh, I've shot on phantoms before, and uh, that's that's just that's amazing watching it happen really really slow. Uh, everything the slow-mo guys do on YouTube is a great, great perspective. Yeah, definitely. I'd also add one of the coolest Christmas presents that I've gotten in a very long time was this $8 pocket microscope that like just makes every hike more fun. Like you can just look at plants, you can look at flowers, you can look at fungi. Like, Is that it? Are you holding it right now? Yeah, it's like it's fits in a pocket. It's tiny. Okay. It's not like a ton of magnification, but it's enough that you can see like the next level of there's a lot going on in the world. Like it gets you just a little bit beyond our current scale of like we're big, we're doing big things. Power and of ten kind of thing. Yeah, it's like that first power of ten over, and it's just like microscopes are cool. By the way, Camille, uh, I got your, your powers of ten thing. I got it to. Uh, it's still a little bit sticky, but that's fine. Oh, this. good, good. I, I'm glad I didn't give you a non-functioning uh, gift. Hmm. Thank you. What is that? Uh, Camille can so explain that's it. a flip book. Um, that's a flip book with one side being the powers of 10 generated via Dolly and the other side being the powers of 10 generated via someone like manually Google searching. Oh, uh, cool. you know, so like, I guess a manual. A clip interpreter or clip interrogator um but it's just a really beautifully done project by this uh, graphic designer who i really like and it comes with this like nice scene about it and stuff it's like a nice like book that's also an object kind of vibes nice that's really that's cool stunning. where'd you get the flipbook printed oh it's not my work um it's this work of kelly uh, anderson kelly with an i Oh, is my teacher now. I'm oh, is she? With her. Yes. Oh, wow. Tell us she's more. so awesome. Yeah, she's. Speak on that. What do you mean? And not 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 the awesome part, but like, what's the class and all that? It's paper engineering. How do you know she's she's cool? <laughs> Prove it. I mean, what's the class that you're taking? Paper engineering. Where is it at? Where are you doing that? Uh, it's there are two versions. One is online. That's one I'm making, obviously, because she is in, in Brooklyn. And uh, the other, and there is another session that is uh, in real life uh, there in Brooklyn. Uh, and it's great. 
you awesome. learn uh, about uh, her approaches to paper and um, making some uh, origamis and stuff like that, distillation. It's fun, it's playful. I'm a huge fan of her uh, like risograph animation work. It's so much fun. Yes, they are amazing too. We built, uh, let me show you. This, I don't know if you can see it. This Wednesday, we, the project in the class was to build this pinhole camera. There should be a very small hole in here. And this is completely built out of paper templates and folded and uh, you can add here the, the paper, photographic paper, and uh, make a photo, a real photo out of this. So it's, it was really fun. Cool. She was one of the early uh, people to get the Adobe grant. Like when Adobe first started having a grant program, that was like worth real money. I think she's one of the first people who got it. Um, do we want to do some project updates? Yeah, sure. That'd be cool. Yeah. I can start green pages. Um, we had a really fun meeting. So what you might need Last... to do, Thomas, just uh, cause they're new people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll introduce the project. Um, green pages is a meant to be like a, it's a publication, maybe like a trade kind of trade magazine, but, but fun for the film industry, uh, where we're bringing our kind of design fiction, uh, sensibilities to it so we're trying to like create material that sparks thought about what the future of filmmaking and, and cinema could be um and within the magazine or we're, we're, we're uh writing design fiction articles we're making advertisements we're doing like industry news segments and we're we're putting this all together into a package and it's uh yeah just meant to be like a kind of our our thoughts and imaginings about what um hollywood and and cinema as a whole could could be in the next in the near future um and so i guess in january we kind of did our first real sprint and made like a small booklet sizzle reel of what it could be. And now we're kind of going to go through that process again. Um, the last format we tested was housing the publication in a DVD case. Um, so you open up the DVD case and then there's a, there's a booklet in it. Uh, this time around, uh, I've been just getting my hands on as many magazines as I could, as I can and kind of just seeing what feels good. Like now I'm kind of thinking about going for something that feels heavy on a desk and really stands out in like a CEO's office. Um, so I'm working on making a template for that format. And then uh, some of us, Julian and, and Florian are working on, Julian's working on an advertisement. Florian's working on another article. He wrote an awesome one on a movie about the line. So it's like a fictional film where they were making a film about the line, the city that they're building, Saudi Arabia, and how like, it's basically like using the fictional film as a way to critique the city itself and also talk a little bit about the near future of cinematography. Dre made an awesome poster for that. Um, this is all in the, the chat, but that's kind of our update. And I think, I think we're, we're going to meet again next Tuesday with, with our materials. Um, if anyone's interested in checking it out, uh, there are some, 
there is a mural page that you're free to join and also our Zoom meeting. And feel free to click around on there uh, and like definitely feel free to claim a project and just start making. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is like, this isn't meant to be like a super Uh, it's not like every ad has to have the same tone. It's not like every ad has to have the same look. It's like a collection of materials. So we can all be kind of adding our own uh, take and personality to them. Um, so we, I don't know, we have some fun ones like uh, a future where, you know, all, all movies are completely made in front of a desk. So there's like a 3D scanning bounty program where people are collecting locations so making kind of an advertisement for that where where you know we, we're advertising maybe the program um, another one where we could go on forever is like advertisements for new camera equipment um, and yeah i don't know i think we've one of the conversations we had that really got us going last week was just talking about how changing from physical, like the, the problems or just new issues people would face in the, by changing physical locations to digital locations and like what kind of disputes or economies or types of people that would kind of create. Um, that was a pretty fun one to talk about. Yeah. Do you have like a particular vision of the industry that you're playing to? I, I, I just want to say I spent decades roaming around in Hollywood trying to sell my digital puppetry. I used to do live digital puppetry and sort of a proto deep fakes where we would pre-render all the information by hand and then you could remix it to make interviews. And everything I thought I knew about Hollywood wasn't true. I mean, there's no pile of technology there. It's all bought and sold every show. It's just like vapor. The whole thing is vapor. And it comes together in brief moments, but it's just so, such a, so, so flimsy. So flimsy. Yeah. And yet everybody's trying to look like big established studios. And, and I think that for my vision of the future is it's going to all dissolve into personal movies where some really articulate person works with an AI and scripts a bunch of prompts that I buy. And then I can run around inside of an AI's rendition of that filmic environment somehow. Yeah, so there's have... almost, there's almost no there there, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I totally hear what you're saying about like how once a show ends, whether it's like everything kind of disappears and like all the whole fleet of trucks you're using is now redistributed to a bunch of other shows that are using the trucks and no one owns all rentals, no one owns anything. Uh, no one owns but, the, the identities even of the, of the characters soon. I mean, Mickey Mouse is going to be up and everybody quotes everybody in music. So why can't I this, these, these characters aren't supposed to be owned. They're supposed to be cultural archetypes. So that's weird in itself. I think I so. Uh, hey, random. That's good to see you, my friend. Yeah. Hey, it's me. Remember me? Of course I remember <laughs> you. Jesus. Every time I talk about, every time I talk about the trajectory of my, uh, my professional trajectory. So, so Philip, AKA random. And I know each other from way back to my Seattle days. And I tell the story about my, uh, my exposure when I went to when I joined the hit lab and I was like I was a little bit baffled I was like wait what's going on here and and I'm 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 like 100% positive I mean it could be one of those kind of reconstructions where I was like yeah I'm like so what what's the deal like I don't get what you guys are talking about like I'm just trying to and you just kind of looked at me and kind of gave me this sort of like knowing nod like I I got you young young Padawan go down to the pioneer <laughs> the park place or pioneer square bookstore and get a copy of william gibson's neuromancer and then in my vision of it you just kind of like you sort of turned around and sort of 
and sort of floated away about like two millimeters off the ground without moving your legs. <laughs> <Just got to, laughs> we're done there and got it's uh, possible. Got uh, yeah, those were you. You days. were like basically the, it was like the lab manual was uh, was was Neuromancer. Is how I it's how I kind of felt you know from that it's like you're not going to understand what everybody this was living out of yeah yeah you're not going to understand this from that stupid stapled you know uh, lab manual sheet that was tucked into something that said there's the eye wash station and here's who to call if there's an emergency like that's all bullshit we're 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 building cyberspace here <laughs> yeah cyber what what'd you call me <laughs> yes it's a long road yeah. so uh, the I think what I like about the Green Pages idea is that there's going to be just inconceivable offerings, um, but but they're going to be they're not going to look like like the traditional industry. I, I think it's I, I don't know how it works anymore. I think the the coolest thing about AI to me is that it's going to it's putting everybody on this edge of what is the difference between scarcity and abundance. Because you can just ask for what you want, and if you can imagine it, it's it shows up in your in your inbox if you know how to ask right. And and and, and movies are always trying trying to create panic and scarcity, not trying to create a sense of abundance. That's what's different about this group. That's why I follow you guys, because the the inconceivable thing to most people is the utopic answer not the dystopic answer and the the dystopia is is hollywood is just soaking in it they just want more they want more for less and they want to make the biggest thing anybody's ever seen it, it's just such a set of contradictions you know and and humans are crushed inside of it. I don't know. I think one of the things that we're that we're that we're kind of feeling into with the green pages project from my perspective and what makes it kind of work and also be you know kind of fun is that we're act, we're like we, we feel like I feel the things that you're talking about, right? Like you know I I into a certain sense like I get it. And then we're 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 very deliberately working from um I just the way I kind of visually imagine it is from is from the bottom up. So like I'm not trying to, I don't know the overarching thing, but like, we'll be, we'll be doing, you know, Thomas will be running a workshop and be like, oh man, I know exactly how to kind of represent that feeling that we're having or that you're kind of, you know, you're expressing. So we'll make a, you know, there's a bunch of ads, Thomas, aren't there or something where there was, I remember I did the one with the cinematographer guy. Like, so we did the classic image of a cinematographer sitting on a, you know, a pile of apple crates, well lit, you know, as if he's on, on set. Right, but he's actually in a you know in a studio to get his headshot or you know his, his his shot done for this ad, and I think it was like talking about like hey I use brand X's um, and I forget the names we were using, but essentially like their their uh, their starting point um, you know models for for all my actors, you know so the implication is that there you know maybe maybe there's there's maybe there's some human actors they're also kind of you know, puppeted or AI generated actors or whatever. So like that stuff is hygiene. But what we're trying to do is like not really describe didactically what this world looks like, but imply it to the degree of people are like, wait, sure. so what's going on in this world? And so it's, you know, trying to represent all these, you know, beautiful well, all, kind of confusing you know, things. Every piece of like animation timeline, like get by our kinematics, you know, yeah. give the Give the kinesic you need to your characters with our our library of wonderful yeah. acrobats. It's so like that kind of thing, and then there's then there's there, there, you know there'll be places like you know, um, and and of course there's brand X, Y, and Z, you know. So like the other guys, you know, you, you find ways to show that there it's actually, you know, like as much of a shit show as things are in any part of any part of any world. Um, there and that's you know, just more you know, fragmentation and more of a finer grind on the same product though yeah so exactly sort of so which is which is i mean you know if you flip through like like cinefax or american cinematographers one of our reference points it's just it's like a mess they're like really crappy ads done by someone's 17 year old niece because she has photoshop that's like you know the and you know we're we're in some we're in sherman oaks uh you know we're ready to serve you and all your needs for uh algorithmic uh, cleanup and 
you know, and, and, and final fi final uh, dialogue editing, because you imagine this world where there are all these kind of ancillary, tertiary sorts of services, yeah. and you just want to kind of flesh that whole world out so it doesn't feel seamless and complete. It feels as and as you're sort of representing as fragmented, confused, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's a shit show but, still. But I guess that's fundamentally my problem currently as a futurist, which is why is everything so dystopic? And it seems like it's because people can't imagine anything else. And so the promise of technology remains a carrot that's always in the future, but never actually what we're achieving because we're just going to build more of the same crap. And I know that's a big thing to lay at your feet because of what you do. But at the same time, we're the only people who are imagining the future. Mm -hmm. So how can I'm really get... curious from the perspective of people who are involved in cinema and in uh, other things, if the social relations of prestige television differs, because uh, one of the things that has happened over the last 10 years is that television has become sort of technologically and culturally impactful. Uh, and there are much more durable and enduring shows uh, in terms of the people who are sort of collected around it. Uh, do they still suffer from the same transients or are there sort of slightly different pockets of models of social relations that that are occurring as a consequence of having the expectation that that you know game of thrones could be around for 20 years and stuff like that well the the way that any given genre even instills a cultural dynamic is twisted to me like just laugh tracks being the best example of socializing really harsh behavior and just laughing it off and then let's go back to a normative moment again and that 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 i watched that instill sociopathy into my teenage friends because you know you have to say it's not funny unless everybody's laughing you know they don't get it because the cutting slash at their friend and then uh, the group laughs and then we'll go on to the next joke and by the end of the show, everything's all set and clean and ready for the next episode. And that's just not life, but that is really distorting. That's a Hollywood vision of 1950s that's slowly trickled down to now. It's really bizarre. So anyway, maybe there's something inside of that for the green pages, because to me, it's like, what are we imagining as a society? That's what Hollywood's imagining. And, and it's almost like we just, like shunted that function societally to them and then all they can imagine is the last big first person shooter so we'll make another one of those so it's not really a functional system that that's my complaint Thank you for waiting. Thank you. Thank you. i'll be quiet i think i don't know i, I think no, it's I, a, go ahead go ahead i i was just gonna say that's I, that's I think it's really fascinating to 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 pick at those sort of foundational aspects of the of the culture of it, and I also wonder if like that that trans like that that transient um, nature of cinema cinematic production is a, is a function of the sort of the regulatory uh, environment in which they, they exist. That shell companies are sort of advantageous, or if the 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 cause led the effect that people wanted to work in that transient way, and so then they they created the structure that incentivized those things, but. But again, like, I, I think it's really fascinating in the context of Green Pages where like, you know, the, the, the obvious things are like, which kind of cinematographer AI you're using, what, what kind of uh, showrunner if you if you want to give up the heck things for that, but, but, but also like, some of the, like the, the more baseline cultural things that actually underpin what it is that a different place is. So like, for, like, you know, like I just heard about like with RRR was made in Tollywood, which is the, uh, the other uh, Indian uh, Hollywood, yeah. uh, other Indian Bollywood, and just yeah, like the fact that there must there must be different uh, social and cultural relations, different regulatory environments, and that will give rise to a very different kind of cinema. And if you could actually uh, pick and choose uh, that based on genre or anything else, would be a really interesting thing to be able to kind of introspect in Green Pages as well, because they're more diffuse in terms of their impact on what it is you're doing, but having a like a like a, a cheat sheet or of like what the way that, that those different things impact uh, genre or, or production values or costs and things like that would be, I think, a, a, a funny way of like pulling it back to the, the immediate relevance of people who have some but not total sort of um, 
visibility into what it is that Hollywood as a machine is. Well, the miracle of it is the way that they can manifest, and I mean it to everybody that sees the movie and manifest these visions and they do it so efficiently and so cost effectively with these timelines that are made out of nothing. Uh, you know, the, the, these systems where they just contract everybody in and they set up the whole production line and it runs, you know, like Shrek. Shrek, the original Shrek was lost in the, in the digital tar pit. They had to remake Shrek because by the third movie, they couldn't open the files from the first, second movie. And so there's the, there's the thing, you know, rebuild your asset off of old assets. You see what I'm saying? But, but my point here was really that the superpower of Hollywood is that production organization and talent. The talent behind the, the showrunners is insane. I remember talking to one of them who was doing, we were doing a, 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 a media junket. So we had all these people coming through to see the movie and get introduced and sit and interview. And um, this was for Bugs Bunny. And so they were sitting down and interviewing with Bugs Bunny. And the lady who was running the show, I was just like, how do you do all of this? Because she was sitting there calmly talking to my little part. And she was like, oh, that's a funny story. We did the, the release for some military movie and we rented an aircraft carrier and we brought everybody in. And we had the junket, the, the guy who was coordinating was looking at my timeline and he saw that I had these interviews programmed with 15 minute intervals or something. And he's like, don't you think that's gonna get fucked up? And, and she was like, no. And he blew, she blew the doors off of the military uh, management. They couldn't believe how tight her ship was compared to their ship once she was on an aircraft carrier. And I think that speaks to the real thing. There is some kind of deep-seated organizational skill set that that's really futuristic. That's, that's where the vision, to me, these guys are skilled at manifesting. These are the guys that are skilled at manifesting. That's what production work is. They're just doing the wrong thing. That's, that's how I feel about it. It's like we need philosophy consultants and, and people like Julian who can, can articulate a better future a different alternative that the they don't blue sky that stuff they they just take the old script and 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 that's why i think the prop script writing might be an angle or something because it's just there's a total lack of vision because it's the first person shooter problem this is what made money before so we'll make another one of those and then there's also places in the industry where like you know like what's his name's a huge filmmaker coppola so he can't, he doesn't want his nephews around. He doesn't want all this family getting up in his tree. So he gets a building and he sends them over there to do production and they get all the money and all the scripts and they can just whack off and make whatever movie they want because there's literally, they're just being funded to get him out of his hair. And, and there's whole buildings in Hollywood that are just doing production with no means of support like that. And, and that, that, that's what drives me crazy about it. The, the imagination, I mean, imagination is supposed to have bad ideas. So maybe that's just manifest in physical form in Hollywood. I don't want to derail your meeting. No, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I used to work in production um, and it is kind of, the reason I, I switched out of it was like a, a kind of this, it was like, these directors would give me projects and then my job was to make them happen. It wasn't to like think creatively about it. It was to like be their therapist and also make, make sure they felt like they were getting what they wanted even though I wasn't giving them what they wanted. Um, and then we'd end up with a movie and it was great, but well, it was, but it wasn't, I mean, I stopped having fun after a while. So I, like, yeah. I, I think there is like a, it's, but it is a super fragmented industry and maybe it is a, like, are you proposing like a, a, a more seamless film industry? <laughs> well, no, I'm actually proposing that by the time AI gets done with it, you're just buying prompts and it's all synthesized for you. So you have custom individuated movies. So you're just buying all of the scenery still is valuable. One of the conversations I had was with like dressmaking. When, when the movies changed to reality TV, the dressmaking industry collapsed. 
there was really good seamstresses in Hollywood. Clothing and outfits were where they put their money. And when it shifted to reality, that all became off the shelf and, and behind the scenes sponsorships. And so they got, it's all about saving money. So they all get their, the clothing company sponsor them and then they don't have to do wardrobe. So the wardrobe industry collapsed. And the, 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 the you can say the same thing about big band music, all the bands that used to support all of the talk shows and the t the music, all that stuff just gets smaller and smaller as synthesis comes in. Benjamin, you're just gonna have to push your way to the bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's, no, there's no tap. There's no tapping on the shoulder. Like, excuse me. Uh, so can I? Uh, just, a little no, okay. um, just to jump in on this, like, because I, I started doing some like work with some stop motion stuff earlier this fall, and. The fact that making any movie is so goddamn labor intensive is like the biggest takeaway. Like the hardest part about making a movie is the amount of work is just astronomical. Um, like it's just like the most like it is made out of sweat and tears. And like there's a sense of uh, Disney's original Pinocchio is very much like a meta movie where every single frame is drawn by hand on this story about a boy being created out of life by a carpenter is like very much the process of making an animation. Um, and then a friend was telling me about how 101 Dalmatians was also sort of the same story where in the 50s, Disney was about to go out of business and they used Xerox. It was the first movie to use Xerox to make the background frames. So it's also very much a strange meta movie in that it's about the process of infinite copies of the same thing as a metaphor for animation and production. Viewers. Have you ever seen the comparison of the dance scenes between Alice in Wonderland and, and I think the Jungle Book? The, oh, the, wow. It's exactly the same dance maneuvers, but different characters. They literally just traced the whole dance so they didn't have to redo the timing and all the dynamics. It's insane. It's, it's a good, it's, it's exactly the same dance. Yeah, but I mean, one's a teapot corner, and one's an orangutan. Any corner you can cut, though, is like just time save, money save. Like in this endless pit of it, always takes more labor. You can always do more the, editing. the The last character I did was for Disney, and it was a half hour of production asset, and I used the render farm, twelve hundred machines for a week to produce that, um, and. Basically, it was a five-dimensional character rig. So you could interview and talk, and the character could show you one shot or two shot, and they could move around and point and blink. And all of I had mouth fit a 50-part mouth chart for every one of them. So they love this because they can give an endless amount of content out of the system. That was the cell. That was the cell. And um once, once that 30 minute asset was in the can, I could remix that and that's what I did for them. We produced like eight hours of animation, two cameras uh, in a weekend, all finished. And, and so the, the, they only care about the, the money. So I think that's the bottom line in anything that you're selling. If it's not making things more efficient, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go. Yeah. Well, I guess the thing is like the money is the common denominator, but like the inputs into that equation are complicated because it's a function of labor. It's a function of technology. It's a function of distribution. And so like, as you change, where, those, the, where are the cost barriers in the future? That's what my brain is asking. What are the, yeah. what are the, where, what are going to be the biggest problems? It's sort of either network storage or, or like processing. Right. So if you, if you just move those three over, their, their, net, their distribution is good with Netflix and everything like that, right? Yeah, the market's going to require more and more niche things. And like getting a large market is going to be harder. Like as people fragment atomize, you have to do like many trends where like, if I can only show a movie that's interesting to a hundred people, how much do I have to pay to make this worth my time? Yeah, so, but if I could give you my face at the beginning of the movie and it was showing up throughout the whole movie as a background character or I, I could, you know, insert myself into the POV of the footage and experience it as a first person experience in a VR, why, why, why? I mean, that's, 
to me, that's the experience itself is, is going to change fundamentally, but it's going to change in that way that makes it cheaper. See? And so if I can tailor it in a cheap way by sticking your face on my movie and that buys an audience, it doesn't matter how deeply you behave like yourself. Your friends will think it's funny or you're, you get the, the, you know, still get the same thrill seeing yourself in the mirror with your, you know, other actress person who's famous or whatever. I mean, the, I think the whole experience of hum humanity is going to change through those kinds of things. We're going to be interacting more directly with our archetypes, hmm. right? Hey, should we uh, should we push on, Kemp? Do you, do you want to um, give anything to? Because uh, we got a workshop at noon, right? I think Jed's coming by at eleven. Yeah, we've got. So I, last week I went to. Um, I went uh, bought fabric, well canvas, and some trim, for the chore coat. Uh, for those of you who are new, the chore coat is our first piece of merch, and we're doing a combination physical and digital element to it. Uh, the digital being the accessories, and then the physical is the coat. Um, we've done a couple workshops, ideation workshops, to get to where we're at now with where the coat is sort of being constructed. And we're working through this concept of rail systems. Um, sort of a tactical, we're not going to go, I say tactical cautiously because we're not going to go, we're not going to emulate army or like wilderness necessarily, but um, we are, we're sort of using some of the aesthetic there um, as we prototype, I would say. Um, and then today, well, so then on Monday, Jed and I met up at his workshop and we laser cut, we went through the files and then laser cut two coats. Jed actually continued to cut over the week. Um, one coat in white primed canvas and then one coat in just sort of raw beige canvas. So I and then today, I just realized something. Do we need to, do we need to say what we're working on? <laughs> the coat? Yeah. Did we say that? Did you already say that? Just yeah, for just people who are new. Yeah, they we're just doing like okay. the code is the first piece of merch. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Chore code from the future. Yeah, chore code from the future. But um, not obviously so. It's just from a future. Yeah. So the 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 futuristic part of it, the code itself sort of emulates the past in continuation with sort of the historical nature of the chore code. Our chore code will fall in line with the fact that it sort of blends in. It is a worker's coat. Um, but where it is super futuristic is in the sense of adding these digital filters to it. So every futuristic, <clears throat> um, explorer or every futures explorer from the NFL gets to add their own sort of, um, personal identity to it. And we're thinking about adding this virtual, uh, this VR filter to it. So you'll be able to buy the physical code that you'll be able to filter on your digital accessories and then my goal is to hopefully one day be able to do a little workshop of these accessories um, in real life as well um, so yeah today we're gonna we're gonna hot glue uh, some of these blank canvases so two weeks ago was it julian we did sam jed and julian and i did a chore coat that julian had already and we just sort of like mashed a bunch of different products together that ended up looking like a kid's craft project, a little bit, a little bit like more high end. <laughs> but um, today we're really, we're kind of more blank canvassing it. So I'll post photos as we go, but I'm posting a lot of photos in the merch um, thread. So you can go in there and check out what, what I've been collecting um, as far as imagery goes. But we're gonna be working with some trims some nylon threads. Um, I'm going to go buy some piping um, before I come on over there today. And yeah, that's basically the update. We're just going to continue iterating. The goal is to get the physical garment as close to what we want before we go to a developer so that we can, you know, troubleshoot as much as we need to so that we can be as cost efficient when we go to them and say, this is essentially what we want. And then they'll pattern make and create. 
Yeah. And that's all I got. Oh, and then there's going to be a digital call. I wanted to have it this week, but I got caught up with stuff. So um, I will be probably DMing some of you already, but I, last week I know that Camille, Brandel, Dre, Julian expressed interest in um, digital stuff. Camille, I'm, I don't know if you expressed interest, but I'm roping you in because you said you had experience. And Aaron, I wanted to see, yeah, I was going to ask if you did too. The digital uh, VR filter call, I think has been really fun. So if you have any interest in that, um, I'm going to post it in the, in the general now hear this. I'll also post it in the merch channel. But if you have any experience in VR filters, I'm hoping to have that call on Wednesday. And I've been doing a call at 9 a.m. Pacific time and 5.30 Pacific time so that those who are in uh, New York can join at lunch or after work and those uh, in Europe can join as well. So um, that hasn't been fully committed to yet, but plan that if you can make it. Uh, Benjamin, yeah, you are very actually, much invited with your experience. So yeah, Benjamin, please join. And the past ones are recorded. If you're into that sort of thing, I, I, yeah. I, I put on videos like this uh, and, and just kind of listen to the conversation sometimes as well. So um, we can dig those up for you and see where we've gone in some of these conversations already. Yeah. Yeah. And my past like consulting skill life was always Sam will be triggered by this, but it was always like presentation based. So, you know, I'll probably give like a little presentation first to give us a little like foundation um, so that we're all on the same page, but it helps to like launch us forward, you know, right? So um, the VR filter stuff is new for me too. So I'll probably give like a five minute presentation and then we can go forward and, um, and ideate, but you know, come to the table fully aware that you probably have more knowledge in it than I do. So you're very much welcome. Cool. And that's really the only update. I'll send photos from today. It's been, it's so fun. I wish we could, you know, wish you guys could all be part of the, the prototyping thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I think, yeah, Jeb, I think Jeb was going to come over. I, I, I forgot to uh, go to my, my lockup to get some stuff, but maybe, maybe it sounds like you got plenty of stuff or maybe I can head over there before yeah. you guys. Yeah, we'll play around with it. And then I, I ordered this shirt and I, I don't think it's, and I even said like, send it today. And yeah. uh, God bless them. They were just kind of like, I don't know, who knows, but they, they were like, I got an email like, like a day or more than a day after I ordered it. And it said, your order has been approved. And I was like, approved? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a human on the other end of this. And then it wasn't, yeah. they said it's going to arrive sometime today. Um, no, no later than 9 PM. So it might not show up, but that's okay. But there was yeah. something, there was something very particular that I, um, about about this shirt and it was so to your note about the you know the i think the thing about the the you know the, about the the military influences that have that we've been talking about is is uh is is it, so clearly it's less that we want to um we want to gear up for the great insurrection right it's it's more like this the the trajectory of like of um of uh utilitarian design i find just absolutely enthralling um that that you know things made with person even even the things of like uh when i was looking at dre brought in the the molly system and even reading like the history of that it's like i what i find fascinating is that it shows this trajectory of like well um they didn't have it all figured out like they they were sending right. you know for for centuries i guess you know let's just say for you know, a hundred years, two hundred years, they were sending sending people, dudes out to fight wars, like, and just the equipment wasn't as good as it could have been. And who wasn't thinking? And was you know, let's say it wasn't a bureaucratic thing. It's like we're just looking for you know, random get to your thing. Like we're just looking for good ideas, and there's no imagination within the ecosystem and the supply chain and all that kind of stuff. They're like, I don't know, let's just you know, give them essentially the same cut as. as uh, you know, just like a baggy pair of pants. Right. And then also well, like, well, maybe it would be like good to have a, have a pocket here. And someone's like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe, but it takes, you know, because of the nature of the system takes forever. And so the Molly system in that, in the Wikipedia history, it's kind of like, I mean, that's very, that's super contemporary. So, so you didn't yeah. have that ability to, you know, just, just be adequately 
you know, utilitarian. It's like stuff's just dangling off of things. People are using like tape and kind of like DIY and all this kind of stuff. Oh, Benjamin, it's, I think my, my mushrooms just kicked in or something. What's going on, dude? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I just find that interesting. And I think there are ways in which, you know, all these meta levels, we can tell these kind of stories. So it's not just the uh, yeah. it's just garment. It's like the thing that comes, you know, the little booklet that comes with the garment that explains each piece and that it wasn't just arbitrary. It wasn't just kind of like, ah, we saw it on this. So we put it on this. It's like we had these conversations about it. So anyway, I couldn't agree with you more. And one of the things, so when I went to go buy fabric, you know, I, I went on two tracks cause I'm, I'm sewing new pillows cause you know, the seasons are changing. So I was like, I got to get new pillows for my couch. And so I was like, I want to make them. And so I was thinking about piping and the piping that I was looking at reminded me of the nylon thread that we were looking at. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was holding in one hand, this like very tactical nylon cording or not like flat weave nylon. And then on the other hand, I was holding this like very expensive velvet piping. Right. And so, you know, theoretically two different customers, but it, it, it kind of, I was thinking to myself, well, how, what if we used piping instead of nylon? Um, what if the piping was, you know, there's different ways we can do it, like mashing different materials for, with different purposes. So today I want to kind of play around with that a little bit as we're hot gluing things like what materials have the same purpose or same functionality, but could aesthetically read something different. Right. Um, so that we're not, we're not just creating a tactical coat, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to create a coat that looks like it came out of an upholsterer, right? Like I don't want it to look like it just came out of somebody who makes couch cushions, but there is something to play off of here. And I think a good example of that type of adding on utilitarian functionality on a high-end fashion level would be if you looked at, if you looked at Fendi's collection where um, it was Kim Jones and Mark Jacobs, they did this collaboration for the baguette bag and it was all these like baguette bags which is like the, the classic fendi bag um that they became famous for it was bags on bags on bags right so like you had a bag as a necklace there was a bag as a clutch that went on your hand on a glove and the bag that attached to that bag right so it was all very much influenced by the tactical i don't know if someone was being influenced by army aesthetic but it was very tactical in its nature um yet it's all thousands of thousands of dollars right so you can pull from that without it looking like it's going into the desert or into battle right um and i'm kind of i, I want to make sure we don't go into that aesthetic because that army surplus store aesthetic i don't you know going back to this a comment that was made about green pages I'm optimistic about the future. I don't want it to have this like combative aesthetic. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's a really interesting point because um, just to, just to kind of build on that and to dig into it a little bit. So, so I, I'm, I'm working on this, uh, this auto trader magazine from the future. Right. And, um, and it's, it's filled with like, like cars from the future. And I wasn't sure where I was going. Really, I was just mostly just feeling kind of the the sublime, confusing joy of of getting of coaxing Mid Journey to turn an Oldsmobile silhouette, you know, minivan into something that looked like it was from some adjacent now, or you know, kind of, or or maybe even it was like a different past, like traject, you know, we just went different, yeah. and so like in 1999, this is what cars look like. And in my descriptions of them, my auto trader description. So, you know, Kemp's selling their, uh, their, their 1994 Oldsmobile silhouette. How is Kemp going to describe it in the auto trader? You know, low miles, it's, uh, you know, mostly used this way. Upholstery is a little bit rough in the back and that kind of thing. And so how do you explain that this thing is slightly tweaked? And these kinds of, the, the, the visual representations of these vehicles for anyone who's, you know, I'm not expecting you to, but like has seen them in, in my Instagram feed, they, they are, they, I, I've just been tending them towards like, they're a little bit, you know, they're, they're a little bit kind of rough in, in their, they're kind of, you know, they're worn and they're dusty 
They've got knobbly, you know, rugged overland style tires. They have kind of equipment on the roof of some unknown description, like whatever mid journey feels like they, I mean, when I say, you know, optical designator on the roof, I don't even know what that is, but it figures something out. And so they look like, and so I start to describe them as like, this is, you know, this is, this is great for, for managing, uh, you know, perimeter sweeps um, and this kind of thing. And so it's tipping into this, oh, something is different about the world that requires, uh, you know, like, like, a, like a century of some sort for this. I'm just thinking of one vehicle. It requires someone, it's, it's, it's anticipating like, you know, I'm, this is, we're using this to kind of uh, corral the livestock in the northern perimeter. <laughs> And what I'm trying to do, what I think I'm playing with now, and I'm not saying this is like a forever and always kind of intense value that I have, is like we can it, it, we can imagine a world where it's not like today, where we don't expect everything to be beautiful and perfect, and our and our almond latte is always ready waiting for us. We can be in a we can imagine that there's a world where it's tipped into a different. I haven't said like oh there was there was a nuclear blast, you know, or something like that. It's just like well you know, it's a little bit more rugged. It, it requires, it, it, we're not, we're not uh, all, all sort of tempered by, um, by the possibility that, uh, you know, we, we can have like large mansions and that we don't have to work collectively in order to maintain some semblance of a habitable life and world. So there's like a school bus. All right, so there's still schools. So I'm trying to find the way to imagine into a world that isn't just that isn't the the the, uh, the ridiculously overly optimistic flying cars world, but it's a world where they where it as it, it feels a little bit um, feels feels slightly on edge, but people are managing. It's like almost I don't know. It's not it's not the same at all. But the image that came to my mind is like there was like an episode, or I didn't watch the whole thing it was, um, just because it was too gross for me. But uh, uh, what was the zombie? episodic that everyone was crazy about last of oh us? yeah no not last of us the older older one that was Here, like was, the, the walking dead yeah the walking dead and there was there was at some point like i'm not saying i want to i'm trying to create an imaginary of a, of a zombie world but there's one where they came across it's like oh they're actually civil you know they're, they're collectives they're communities right and they, they seem to be thriving on the inside i'm not sure what happened but like imagine they're thriving on the inside things are good we got schools you know we met and then there's some people who work on on making sure we've got food, some people have fresh water, and there's some people who actually guard the perimeter, right? I remember that. And I was like, this is fascinating. Like, and they, and they managed to create a kind of a sense of community and home and, and you know, well-being and that kind of thing. And so why am I saying all that? I, I'm trying to do my best to find ways to imagine possible futures, like really use my imagination to imagine possible futures where I'm now answering the question, what's it like the next morning what what's the world like what's for breakfast after we've managed to avert the the uh, climate catastrophe right because which is a question i don't think anyone even bothers trying to answer they're just so hopped up about you know of, of uh this is my kind of extinction rebellion rant i love what those guys are doing at the same time they haven't created an imaginary for the world that is enough to enroll me into it. They're tapping into my sense of, you know, one sense of anger and frustration by saying, we're going to meet here and we're going to stop all the trains in London, which is, you know, something that they did. Amazing. I like the kinetic energy and I salute them and I get that they're, that they're, they, they've got an intense level of future anxiety and they're, and, you know, like many people, they're frustrated and rather than, and, and this is what they're doing. And also it'd be like, I would want to say to them, can you really help me understand and feel into a dream of the world on the other side of this? When you've achieved your goal, right? When you've gotten whoever, Royal Dutch Shell, you've gotten, you know, like all the big kind of people that you're protesting against the governments and bureaucracies to be like, you know what, you're right. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Emergency action plan. Uh, we've got a seven year roadmap to, to, to you know, managing all the, the pollutants or whatever. And then, uh, then the other thing we're gonna have to deal with is there will be no coffee or tea on the island of the United Kingdom. It's not gonna happen. What were you thinking? You thought that you were still gonna be able to get your Honduran medium roast? Do you know what that costs the, the world to get that? And they haven't created that imagery of the world where I can start being like, okay, you know what? I get it. 
I'm going to have to start getting used to austerity because it's not going to exist. And you know what, that car that you got, once it, once it, once it, uh, once it finishes up that last tank of gas, that's it. You will not be driving that shit again. So you better figure out some way to convert that into something else like a, like a garden planter or something or convert it to like an EV or figure out, uh, you know, a, Benjamin's uh, hydrogen drive, cold fusion, room temperature, cold fusion. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I think that, you know, in, in these kinds of things that we're creating, these some of these products from the future can also tip into that. Like, and so we can say like, you know, this is what this short coat is what you might wear in a future in which these are, you know, these are certain things that you have to do. One of your tasks from, from you know, your job, because your job isn't, sure as shit isn't going to Google every day. Forgive me, anyone who recently got laid off from Google and is still in the anger phase. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the shouting for it phase at this point, sorry. <laughs> is to be like, oh yeah, what is work? Because they also haven't answered that question. How do I make a living? How do I teach my kids? And so I feel like one of our jobs is to is to begin to construct these really, really hard imaginaries and do it in in a in a way that does, isn't like punitive. It isn't like nah, nah. It isn't it isn't shouting for it. <laughs> I'm allowed to experience that at this moment, but uh, it isn't that. And so we can say like this is why this pocket is on there, and this is why. Yeah, yeah. I know you. I feel like you're getting vibes of like I'm not saying you. I'm saying we're responding to someone. You know, one of your colleagues um at you know whoever at louis vuitton is like hey kim can you know i don't get it this seems just like like military wear let me tell you the story about this one pocket and why that's there and yes it's derived from a, a piece of you know a piece of military uh, a military de- garment and why because it's incredibly i mean it's clever it's really smart and i'm not going to avert that because in this world yeah someone's going to need to be able to reach really quickly i figured it out for a tongue depressor that's in the molly clip because it's used as a tourniquet. So I have well, a tongue think, depressor and a little piece of little, you know, little tear of, uh, of, of, uh, of fabric. And in case someone gets as an accident, I know how to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, my, I've been collecting all these images of army gear, but also like gardening gear, gardening gear came in like, you know, post COVID has become, super popular and it's a good sell right now but um the fact that the you know and the fact that the coat works so well because it is a worker's coat so much of what we're i think it's it's the merch being focused on working collecting the 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 element of work is sort of the a foundational element of the coat right like creating something that does something like we don't know what the future and everybody's future, near future concept is different. But when you're going out into it, you know, you're not, even if you're sort of just evaluating or experiencing it, you're still, the coat still acts as a companion piece and works with you. So I, I feel like there is tactical in the sense of work still resonates right i i don't want it to i don't want it i guess tactical versus combative right like yeah, that maybe yeah, is a yes. good distinction that's a good distinction that's a good you distinction. know which um, isn't to say that the zombies might not might you might might need to do some combat and it might be a combat right. with like with like a like an angry groundhog or something <laughs> yeah and then surprisingly no one in the miro board has posted um i mean i haven't opened this up to my southern relatives but no one's posted anything about accessories for shotguns or anything like that. So we've been, we've been optimistic for the most part, but I feel like the, the coat's going in the right direction. And I feel like this is the part where we just tweak, right? Because, and if we, if we allowed a developer to tweak this, we would waste thousands of dollars doing it, right? Like, no, we, have, oh, they we just, have to have a very clear, I mean, I, which I think is you're doing a great job. We just need to have that yeah. clear vision. So exactly. they're like, they're like, I'm totally feeling you. Like I'll, I'll take it from here and I'll call you back in a week or something. Well, they'll just, they always feel you, right? Like a developer's always like, oh, this is fucking amazing. And you're just like, that's not what I wanted at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that's why I love that we're doing this and I'm glad we have a spot to do it in. So even if it feels repetitive, it's so much better to do it over and over again until we get it right. Um, so yeah, I'm actually going to run off to Joanne's where I'm starting to know everybody by name. <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> and the, the silk and fabric thread place where I got a guy's number last week who works there, which has gotten really awkward now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so you're going to run. Sam, yeah. are you coming? Is Sam coming? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Can I just cool. order you guys the same thing for lunch so we don't have a whole menu situation? That's Sounds perfect. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. All right. I will see you guys. Um, I'll see you at noon, right, Julian? Yep. Cool. Um, and then I'll post, if you haven't seen the photos from last week, check those out. And Julian, I think Sam, you guys both posted photos. So yeah, take a look at the awesome coat where it's at already. Awesome. Cool. Cool. I'll see you guys. See ya. See ya. A bunch of this has gotten me thinking. Um, I posted something in the uh, in the office hours chat. Every, everything from from random to Kempe to Julian's comments, like word choice being a, a thing that sort of like can limit or enable sort of narrative possibility. Um, there's this uh, triple bottom line framework that exists within like the B Corp space. You know, people, planet, profit, and like that was super novel. 20 years ago and now, but still people don't really know about it, but there's, there's sort of like a pretty classic uh, three-way Venn diagram um, that I posted there. And, you know, people with planet proper are the main things, but then there's sort of these overlaps and that the overlap between people and planet, the classic word they use is bearable, which sounds awful. Um, it's not exactly a very optimistic uh, approach. And then in the center they have, you know, sustainable, right? Which is sort of land. Um, so when we were making a version of that for the energy company that I work at, Jason wanted to have thrivable at the center and all time at the overlap for people and planet. Um, and, uh, you know, it's his company, so we went with it. But, but you know, I, I sort of like the idea that there's a difference between like being something being sustainable and thriving um, and something being, you know, bearable versus all time. And like that gets also back to like the Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin thing about like the carrier bag theory of fiction, right? Like it ran to your point, like, you know, uh, narrative formats that always, you know, are first person shooter, right? Like there's a hero there, right? But, there, but there's, it's not about necessarily like utilitarian sort of, you know, wh who are the people who are picking up berries along the way? It's always like somebody's, you know, battling against something, right? Like, is there a sort of more mundane form of storytelling that's just, you know, ongoing in some way, you know, not necessarily about, like, you know, winning the day or surviving chaos in some fashion. And then, then I feel that sort of same way about like the way that I'm approaching the skateboarding that I'm doing, right? It's not about conquering the obstacle. It's just like, this is just to get me to the store. Like that, that's my win today is that I, as I got, you know, to the grocery store and back and didn't fall and, you know, got a couple of good wiggles in and that's the story. It's like a, you know, haiku of a, of a skate, uh, of a skate trip. Um, anyway, I'm on a, uh, the, uh, I, I just, I'm lurking a call here because I'm trying to coordinate some insurance. So I might get interrupted. Uh, but the military code for me, well, I want to tell a burner story. So one year I made a glow in the dark jacket with a white linen coat that I ripped the linings out of and I painted it with uh, a europium glow in the dark material. So it, and then I made a UV laser kind of thing. This is before LEDs even. So the, uh, you could draw on the coat and it made like a really bright line. It was beautiful. But I gotten it because I wanted to just look good in the desert and have this white coat at night. But I learned that because I wouldn't have worn a dress jacket otherwise, it was a dress jacket. And, uh, but I learned that all the pockets and all the everywhere that those coats are, is derived from a military line of thinking. And really the breast pocket, the inner pocket, the outer pocket, that coat solved so much of my on in desert needs, it, both being white by day and reflecting light and then having all the stuff at the right place. I, I really never went back after that uh, for my wardrobe on the, uh, in the desert there because it's just so functional and you look good. And, and so I think that the sort of combat ready aspect of it is is sort of like a modern vernacular, tough and thick and, you know, burly, you know, whatever uh, this bulletproof cloth looked like 10 years ago, we'll just keep that aesthetic, you know, because it looks tough. And even though we, 
we could make it super thin now, you know? Military stuff was the first sign of mass production, right? Like the uniforms that were made for the military. Yeah, absolutely. Because the guns design. for, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's guns and, it, and, it's, and it's uniforms, right? And like those were some you, of the first you, things. Do you know Pure War? Have you ever seen the book Pure War? Virilio. It's, uh, Virilio, yeah. Yeah, Virilio. Yeah. Love um, it. It's amazing. Small little book, necessary read. Yeah, logistics, logistics, logistics. Yeah, theories of speed, right? And I mean, and that's yeah. Um, but I think that gets to the idea of looking good and having everything you need. And like the fast seal shop master has the tool at his at his hands. You know what I mean? I think that's that's to me what's fun about the work coat is that it's something I would actually use because it's going to improve my function presumably that's that's a that's a right. thoroughgoing brief to uh to camp i mean I, I don't need to say it over and over to him but i do say it's like i need to be able to wear this and you know kind of basically not feel like i'm on a runway but actually wear it yeah and and and, and actually it's useful and the, the, a, a, a jacket that uh i got for for christmas it's by the by alpha alpha something and it's like it's a it's their build on the classic like um military m65 jacket it's just like a jacket you've seen it all over the place well, all the but it's beautiful generals it's like want to look they want to look good up on their horse baby what i was saying is that this that that particular jacket is like the thing i love about it, it's like you just find thoughtful things and considered things that make it easy to you know kind of have your have your sunglasses protected you know nice secure pockets on the inside that aren't bulky that actually you know they're not attached to it they're actually into the you know, inside the jacket, so it keeps a nice uh, the line. Oh, totally. the inner good. pocket inside the pocket. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, like, what's the difference? Like, what's the opposite of divide and conquer? Right. Like, get, get the chore coat for gather and thrive. Oh, uh, unite and thrive. Uh, yeah. I actually asked Chat GP to generate that list the other day. Wow. Um, like, no joke. I asked. I asked for the opposite of divide and conquer, and it it gave me a few. But unite. And thrive, I think, was the best. Yeah, I, I really lo I love the term gather because it, it's also indicative of gravity. Like you know, things like things tend to flow downhill. You know, so it, you know, at the bottom of the valley, you get you get some real good soil. I have a calendar system I use, and it's it's each week: dream, gather, build, complete. Uh, and first you got to dream stuff up, then you got to gather the parts, and then you do the build, and then you complete. And that's reset, recycle, and you know, do the production notes for the next loop. But gather, yeah. I can. I can Nobody give gives fun. This uh, this will this will maybe be interesting. I've I've talked now to actually now now that now that a few people have left, I've only people uh, here that I've already talked to about this project are Julian and. Dre, Randall and I are meeting later. Um, so I'm, I'm submitting a grant application on, on Monday for this uh, urban prototyping project. And the, the prototype that I'm proposing is um, using a skateboard as a profilograph. Um, a profilograph I saw that profilograph stuff go by and I jumped into the uh, spec, uh, the hardware spec that for California's profilograph. It was pretty interesting. I agree with the uh, phone as being a great place to start for that device. It seems like you could do a ton of it. And I thought it was funny. Julian was still working on skateboard stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we're still, we're still going. Can I push you on very cold? Yeah, sure. In talking to the TIFF yesterday, I started like we started talking about sort of like the augmented human. And, you know, I've, I've had some recent sort of there's some further term uh, visions of this where it's like, you know, obviously the near term is just like use the skateboard to come up with design standards for sidewalk, right? Because there's a bunch of money getting thrown around this in the country right now um, to update spaces for, you know, carbon neutrality and more humane, you know, ways of moving. So I just want to come up first just with like, here's how high your curb cuts need to be. Here's the angle of your sidewalks and stuff like that so that everything is, you know, very flowy and fun. But beyond that, right, like, you know, you can have your design specs, but then you also want to know where it needs to be implemented most. So, you know, a more ubiquitous, like a skateboard profilograph that a lot of people could use, right? And you plug it into, as Dre said, like, you know, open open data sources for cities and stuff like that. So you're actually feeding data from the skateboard to the city so that they're able to use it. 
but then you know long term like what is what is a skateboarding first or an, and a safety first culture look like and you know so then the wearables right so what's a helmet that you actually want to wear um, because you know skateboarding is so convenient as a mode of travel that anything that you add to it slows it down right i can grab my board walk outside and go if i have to grab my board and my helmet i'm already doing more and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm so many more steps towards like having to take my shoes off to put on my roller skate or go to the garage to get my bike or you know, anything else. The skateboard is so convenient. So, you know, what's, what, what's a helmet that would actually compel you to wear it? Yeah, I was, excuse me, I'm getting pulled off. I totally align though. And, you know, so Dre had ideas of like, you know, an EEG monitor, right? Uh, like, so, you know, the Muse headset that measures like your A and B brain waves, And so like would actually you know, it would pull you, it would let you know when you got pulled out of the flow state. Um, and then of course, like you could have, you know, Brandel's been talking about like the accelerometers, uh, you know, in AirPods, right? So you could, you know, you, you could put that in a helmet as well. Um, there's also like those shocks headphones, right? Like those ones, that, you know, they, they, you know, vibrate the bone in your ear and stuff like that. And anyways, it's just like, it's just got me thinking about a helmet project, right? Like, you know, there's sort of, um, the, the the sort of the supplementary piece of of hardware that would that would pair with the skateboard to help you get sort of like not just the data of the board itself but the you know the, the biometric data that you needed and if you know if you could have a helmet that was both your speaker system and your accelerometer like your IMU system your speaker system your lighting system and also your EEG monitor and like in order to get all those sensors in the right spot, you'd have to fasten it properly. So like now you have a compelling reason to wear your helmet and put it on the right way. And you're not just like, because the class thing is, I don't need a helmet, I'm not gonna fall. Well, okay, right, you're probably not. And then eventually you do. And then, you know, it's taken you a few seconds to go from, you know, being a PhD candidate to being a, a bowl of soup, right? And like, that sucks. And so, you know, but, but I appreciate people sort of like not wanting to entertain that, that possibility. And so, you know, if you could make a helmet that was instead something that people really wanted to wear because it was going to like give them all this useful feedback. Um, it just seems like that's sort of like a longer term extension of this. You know, there's there's cool bike helmets now. Skate helmets kind of still suck. They're kind of stuck in the past. And, but even bike helmets, like there's more you could do. Um, so I think a lot of people like, as well, like the coat, you know, how does the coat fit into like, you know, what's a coat that I can skate in? Right. And like what sorts of data could it feed into the whole thing as well? Could you have the coat have a helmet hoodie? Oh, that's so you problem. could you could you could put the helmet in the in the hood. The problem was snap it on the it, it a, snap snap on a hood a helmet collar piece that attaches to the helmet and puts it in the back of the head, and then you just have a flip up. Yeah. There's a Swedish company that actually makes like a a airbag sort of hood collar helmet that just explodes when you have a certain amount of impact. That's what it does that. The other thing though is I think like speakers is probably the way to go. Cause like I see tons of people like skateboarding down the boardwalk with like, you know, it's some giant fucking speaker in their fanny pack or something, mm -hmm. which is just kind of terminally uncool. If you just integrate, like you get a lot of battery in a helmet. You could probably just have a pretty good speaker with like nice, you know, 360 surround sound. And you get to like blast it. I think that would justify like people carry giant speakers with them as they bike and as they skate. Why not just like put a boombox in your helmet? You guys are driving me crazy by coming up with everything I've already explored. I uh, built a what I call a rocket belt, which had two PA stack amplifiers, like you find it your biggest rock show. So in the horns, so they hang down by your thighs, and they look like rockets. And then a little T8 amp, battery powered amp and a handheld synthesizer. And seriously, I was able to do DJ invasions and just so much sound come, come, comes out of that. And you, you spend some time doing that and you get to a new level of what it is to make noise. Let's put it that way. And um, it's really good for your soul. And our society doesn't typically allow it. It's a burning man, you can walk around in the desert and interact with people that way. And uh, the whole idea of like a boom bike, a boom box on my bike was not enough, was not loud enough. So I, I'm, I'm off for very loud noise, let's, let's put it that way. 
I, I'm on this call with insurance. I've been working on for weeks, so I, I'm sorry to be jumping on and off. Um, okay, so the the this, I, I'm I'm sort of I'm wondering if anybody can kind of tell me how they how they best prefer me to sort of like you know give updates on this project because it seems like you know I could do some in office hours I could have like a regular sort of group meeting specifically about the skateboard for Philograph I could post notes in the in the um, Trip City thread I'm like keeping you know a, a running note stock of like the of the, the individual chats I've had with folks um, and that's been really great and it's cool to sort of see the ideas stack on top of one another. Um, but, you know, if anybody has a preference for this sort of stuff, I'd definitely be curious to know. Um, but anyways, what I'm, when I'm sort of settling in on for like a minimum viable product for the, uh, for the grant application is just, you know, it starts with putting sensors on the skateboard and, um, yeah, putting sensors on the skateboard and just like getting some basic sense of like emotional and physical turbulence, right? So between biometrics, um, uh, you know, from like an Apple watch, the accelerometer information from AirPods, and then like the LiDAR from the, from the iPhone, like we could probably use all existing Apple products and get basically everything we need, right? Like position of head, body information, and then skateboard as, as what it sees. And like that alone could get you. Pretty GPS. Cool. Yeah. GPS from the phone also would, would be really great. And, and the, actually, you know, somebody, uh, Filippo brought up a good question of like, you know, how ethical GPS gets once you start to scale because people take their boards into their home and then it looks like you're basically tracking them and stuff like that. So there's some, you know, some good questions around like once you have a more ubiquitous uh, skateboard for Philograph, right? It's a different, it becomes a different Carl. project. Like once it's a commercial, I yeah. think, you know, it changes. But as, but as a first order, the product would just be like, you know, a single skateboard that we you know, collect a bunch of data from and then you know, Brandon, you and I'll talk later, but I'm, I'm sort of wondering like how realistic it is to start thinking about putting together like a virtual street where we can basically yeah. illustrate, you know. I'm not sure. I, I must, because it's in my iPad. And I... uh, you know, if, if we can illustrate sort of like the basic physics of like what's happening and then have some basic, you know, some parameters, right? Like, you know, this is what an ideal curve looks like, ideal expansion gaps, you know, a better, just sort of starting to like, you know, posit some improved designs. Because I think that, Within a six month time frame, like we could probably come up with like basically a project proposal that you could give to any city that's interested in improving its streets and be like, well, we think, you know, we did some we did some research and turns out this is the best sidewalk design you could have. And so like the city of San Francisco as it says, like, well, what do we get? What is a slow street, right? Like what, what is a complete slow street that doesn't have any cars on? We're like, well, it's this, you know, and that that becomes like a deliverable within a six month time frame. We could, you know. Do it as a video game we could do it as architectural renderings or whatever else um and it's something that you could gather with like you know one or two prototype operators and it doesn't have to be anything beyond that i think that you know there's a future that it's like okay we figured out how to make the very streamlined like iphone of skateboard profilographs and there's also a digital interface that you access the world through and you know it's got your your urban city guide and you know your helmet companion and all of these other things but in the short term if we could use existing Apple products and then at the end of the day, end up with like some virtual representation of an ideal. I think that's a pretty achievable goal, but I, I'm not the computer whiz. So I need a reality check. Yeah, no, I think uh, when you, I mean, when you develop, um, you know, the, the applications and the, the interconnect between all of the devices yourself, then you have pretty much free rent to collect all of the data. Um, it's uh, like a a Apple doesn't um, let sort of untrusted third, third parties get all of that data. So, you know, you don't, you like your heart rate doesn't get linked to the internet um, by a way of doing those things. But if you, you build an app and you give it to yourself and to your friends and things like that, uh, we talked about for the chore code using test flight to distribute applications, same thing applies there so that you can, you can get whatever you desire out of those things. And, uh, I'm sure that people misuse that and scan things, but there's a level of sophistication that uh, uh, that that means that most people would know what's happening. So yeah, you can get you can get uh, a, a, a lot of really incredible data. You'd have the ability to integrate that data as well. So whatever whatever sort of signals and inputs and stuff like that. Um, on the in terms of the visualization and things, um, if we can get you know information about the way that 
roading sort of features are shaped, then we can build yeah procedural uh, generation systems. Like um, I don't know if I sh well we I can show you on the call, but you know like I've built in the past uh, procedural generations of like birthday cakes and books and and other things that are visible directly on the web. And with a device like a Oculus Quest, you have the ability to kind of view those in 3D and VR um, uh, instantaneously. I've got like a Art Deco table that I build as well, uh, just for for giggles. So if you have um, specifications and details, then it's possible to then not just build the static representation of those, but ones that have the ability to flex and change uh, with constraints to the extent that they um, they uh, the that they can be encoded within a system like that, um, either you know through uh, inter and interconnect with some application like Houdini or a friend of mine works at Trimble, uh, the building the computational geometry core for SketchUp, and um, that could actually be interesting for him to be like, how would you approach building something so that somebody could use the that's a better computational geometry core, it has the ability to modify stuff a lot better, uh, sort of at a film effects level. Um, and so, yeah, that could be an interesting opportunity to do, to, 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 to sort of uh, propose is be like, uh, we want to make a really nice city block. Uh, how would you supply that data over so that people could kind of view it in real time in VR? So, yeah, I think a lot of really interesting options for um, being able to collect and then uh, to kind of represent that data later on. Cool. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, exactly that, like making something where like it's you could be plugged into people's existing data sets, like whether it's Google Maps or Apple Maps or like a city's sort of open data set, you know, and, and thinking about too, like the, the value of looping in like engineers, uh, like like actual road engineers inside of like concrete engineers. I, I definitely I've, I've got links to those sorts of people, but they could be really fun to have on a team because they could tell you like these are the things like these are the tools we use to make a sidewalk. Right. And these are the things that are the tip, the classic headaches. And you can sort of, you know, I would talk to the guy from Caltrans and he was like the, the biggest people who who are telling us no all the time are like, you know, the maintenance people and stuff like that. And so like making sure that, you know, you were meeting them at their needs um, would be a great way to kind of like preempt pushback because so many of like the bureaucrats were like, well, we think this is a good plan. Like, you know, th they're often like in the back of their mind, like wincing about, you know, getting yelled at by the the sort of blue collar maintenance person, um, you know, who doesn't, who's going to tell them fuck off, you know. That's so funny. The two of the people that I met uh, up with when I was in New Zealand uh, are friends from uh, past lives. Uh, one uh, runs a company called Geocam, which is a sort of one of the providers for Apple Maps and Google Maps. He has just ter like petabytes and petabytes of data of a much higher resolution than he even sells to Google, not because. Uh, not because he withholds it, but because that's not what they need right now. But he has things at a, at a much higher resolution. He says he get, gets sub millimeter accuracy on the distance between two parts of a tree and things like that based on high fidelity GPS and then all of the data that he has there. So it'd be pretty interesting to talk to him about that. And the other friend uh, runs a company called Road Direct, which is a software for traffic management and incident reporting. So civil engineering, road transport engineering, and uh, all of the things that actually go into the the uh, the sort of the job management and and uh, reporting systems that people use to construct um, roads and the sort of that like you kind of say like the 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 interconnect between the the, the technical and the planning um, of what a road is from a from a like physical and regulatory uh, sort of sense. So uh, yeah, like. I won't, I won't pull them in yet, but it's an interesting thing to to think about in terms of a, a hookup to the way that what a road is and what a road needs to be as understood. Right. Yeah. Let's dig into these things on our call. I mean, you know, basically what I'm trying to do is preempt like the the, the far, far uh, up and downstream pushback, right? And just sort of be like, you know, whenever you reach like some part, some person in any individual silo, we're like, well, what about this? And they're like speaking on behalf of somebody in some other silo, like, oh no, 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 we've already dealt with that. I already been like I heard that you know in in when I was going to school for journalism they said that you know you knew it was time to start writing when you when you met yourself coming the other way right like when you were gonna you were going to conduct an interview and and you knew what the person was gonna say because you had you had you know sort of you know scrubbed every every corner for irritants and you you could you know predict um you know what whatever it was that they were gonna speak on behalf of um. And I, I I love the idea that like you know skateboard guy comes into the room and actually is the one who has the whole 
whole picture figured out, you know. Uh, my partner just went to like some city planning thing yesterday for like a temporary housing for houseless folks. And and the uh, the district supervisor got up on her soapbox at the end of the meeting and started yelling at, at, at the people being like, you guys don't understand me. You always get it wrong and just like completely lost it and did, did a really bad job being a, uh, a representative, you know, and we, we definitely don't want to be in, in that position, right? Like finger wagging never gets anybody anywhere. Um, or maybe, maybe it does, but I don't, I don't think so. We, we've, we've tried that. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause it, when you, it, it can operate on people for sure. Where people just sort of cower in, in shame and shame is such a powerful emotion that they'd be like, Oh, okay. How do I get out of this? How do I not feel this? I better do what they say and change my behavior. But get out. So Shame often. on you. Like, Shame. It's like leaving. Like, oh my God, now I'm back in like, now I'm, now I'm five years old. What can I do to make mommy or daddy happy again? Right, but then you realize you're an adult and you just walk out of the room. Oh, if, if you're, if you're well-adjusted and enlightened. <laughs> And you're not completely dysregulated by that shame wagging where you just kind of lose your shit and rationality disappears from your, from, from everything. And you're like, you know what? You're right. And I'm going to turn that around and turn to the person next to me and be like, yeah, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's how religion works. <laughs> Yeah, so Brandon, let's. I hadn't even thought about the fact that like there are people who get the information for Google. Like I, I, my Justin Quimby had to reschedule, so I, I didn't meet with him at ten o'clock, which is fine. Uh, he and I will meet later, but he was the one who was sort of in the thread talking about you know how there's only so much fidelity for Google Maps and things like that, and you know that so many of these sensors are working on like you know the one point five meter basis and stuff. But you know that sort of like the petabytes of millimeter level uh, data, like. That's the kind of shit I'm interested in. And, and then, of course, like the question is like, how, yeah. do you, how do you, you know, get that sort of level of fidelity to map onto like the realities of sidewalk engineering, right? And just like, the, you know, what ends up happening when you have to make something in a non-precision manner and when it gets acted on by sort of like the realities of time and geology and stuff like that as the sidewalks start to fracture and get all fucked up, right? Like, um, Yeah, well... I uh, another thing tying back to this that I think would be really interesting to play with is, uh, you know, like one of the things that Ben uh, mentioned earlier on was time lapse and uh, the impact that it has when you see a, a tree over a year and things. Something that I've really enjoyed. I, I live, uh, my, my family home is at the beach in New Zealand. And, uh, you know, I go down there every day when I have the chance to. And uh, you, you really get a sense that, you know, yes, this, the ocean is tidal uh, and that there are waves and things like that, but absolutely so is the beach. Uh, you know, the, their ebb and flow uh, is uh, probably, I mean, I, I actually have no idea. I, just, I would imagine that, that people have some understanding of the dynamics and tidal forces or whatever they are of, of beaches and what sand flows do uh, over the longer periods of time that you would actually be able to see the undulation of the surface. But it occurred to me that, um, for example, uh, grass surfaces and even uh, sidewalks probably have uh, pretty understood, understandable kind of dynamics in terms of where things are getting pushed and, and, and how they move. And living on the same uh, street block for the last eight years has meant that I've definitely seen you know, places where people have had to increasingly cut back and cut back on these things and, and understand the the, the sheer impact of a tree here or a, a slip here or the, the fact that there's a gutter there. And so being able to get sub-millimeter multi-year data uh, gives you a much better sense of the dynamics of what it is that goes on in a place. And uh, it actually might be really instructive for city planners and, and traffic engineers and things like that to understand the data at this sort of uh, weird uh, temporospatial mix of fidelity where you have like, Sub millimeter multi year uh, to know what actually happens when you apply these design constraints or those design constraints. Um, and like you said, like at some level, you can understand those things to be a low fidelity sort of engineering and production environment. But at the same time, um, it's done literally everywhere in the world. And so, like uh, in terms of the the awareness of what's at stake, what kind of opportunities and risks and costs are ensuing from certain levels of care and attention. Um, 
there's probably a lot to be learned about like, well, what if we do it really well? <laughs> or, or what if we just, you know, say fuck it and then we'll shave it off once we know, you know, so that there are lots of really interesting implications from getting this data and being able to know what happens when people sort of apply X or Y as approaches to the production of the, those, those formations, the curves and things. Right, well, like, you know, so much of the pushback is that these are capital intensive projects, like updating a street is capital intensive. But if you can say, if you can actually say that it's going to be cost productive because it's going to like reduce crashes and improve air quality and like reduce the cost of maintenance and all these other things, if you can be like, look, this is, this is a better design because it's, and it may actually, yes, it's capital intensive in that you have to do something, but maybe it's actually, you know, cheaper to do than make a, make the same sidewalk again, you know? Or, or carry on with your maintenance budget as you already have it scheduled across your 10 year plan or whatever else. Um, yeah. Ben, I'm, I'm curious if you wanna, if you wanna hop in since you're, as you were, I was obviously, you know, prodding to see what you were interested in. Um, all of the stuff that you do sounds like it applies to the stuff that we're chipping away at here. Yeah, no, it's, uh, the skateboard project is sweet. Um, I mean, I do have a skateboard that lives in Venice, actually. Um, so I'd be down to try to help out with this. Um, I also really like the idea of like a long time horizon view on things. It's kind of cool. Like having that, you know, like just seeing like how things evolve. I don't know. I mean, I really wanted is just like a cheap time-lapse camera. One that you could just like sort of set in the middle of nowhere and come back to it in a year. Um, but yeah. Another thing that ti with time that, uh, that is interesting in the context of time lapses, um, I imagine, uh, Ben, you're familiar with Eulerian um, movement magnification, that the idea that um, if you look at things with a specific periodicity, then you'll be able to see from a, re from a reasonable sort of RGB feed, my pulse, stuff like that. So that even though you have, so, so that uh, if you sort of amplify things based on that, that periodicity, uh, then you can see a specific thing. So you can look at individual guitar strings. If you do that with time-lapse, then you can also have the periodicity of what it looks like at the moment of dawn every day, you know, or not just like a time-lapse of whatever, but be able to look at different sort of, like I said, like spatiotemporal kind of um, uh, segments. Uh, so that you can understand specific things like where you can actually average all of the frames or you can look at the exact moment when a when a traffic light goes on every single time stuff like that so th there are some really amazing opportunities from lots of data like that that you can play with oh, that'd be cool you can imagine like how like if you got the dawn you see the sun advancing over the year that'd be really cool to see yeah how does a tree act upon a sidewalk right like a tree root that eventually you know, makes for a bold, like LA has terrible instances of this, right? Like the, the, the road from, from the airport to Venice just has okay. these wild mountains that have been made by the, by the tree branches over the, the tree roots over the year. And like, so, and you know, when you plant trees in a city and like plant them inside of a sidewalk, like you, you do it knowing that you need like 30 to a hundred years for them to like really, you know, take root in the right way to, you know, provide the you know desired effect. But like, how do you make a sidewalk that is going to be accommodating for that tree growth so that you don't get, you know, 20 years in and be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. We got we to gotta cut it down and start over. You know, like uh, I want, I want cities that are covered in, in great trees. Right. And of course we also have like laws that have made it so that you can't have um, female trees in cities because uh, we don't want people to eat for free. So, you know, there's no, there's no fruit. Like, of course it's like, it's, you know, they, they, it's ostensibly so that you don't have fruit that drops and seeds in the ground. And granted, I, you know, seeds on the ground is bad for skateboarding, right? You hit all those little, the little, little uh, the pits and you go, and you, you fall to a stop. So that's, bad. but I would love, I would love there to be, uh, you know, at least somewhere where I could go get some free fruit. I do agree with that, but also rats are a problem. Just I mean, rats exist no matter what, you know? So, yeah, but they'd be more like, it's, you can't free fruit, the rats will, proliferate i like I, I agree with you in spirit but also rats are a problem <laughs> so maybe it's you know maybe it's in parks right maybe maybe we have pathways in parks where the stuff's gonna like you know it's just a, just far enough off the uh off the path that it's gonna decompose properly or whatever else um yeah I, well, I, I've, 
there's like there's different there's different application right there's like there's good sidewalks there's good streets there's good pathways good skate parks right like each of these sorts of things has like a there's an archetype for each of them um there's somewhere that you should be able to go and be be able to lay down and wash your face and you know get out of the rain and throw your trash away and get a free piece of fruit in the city you know and not have to be accosted by like cops or cars or whatever else right like um, yeah yeah i mean like i think the cold water canyon has like an orange grove that's publicly available um which is kind of cool but also they fenced it off so like and now actually is a huge problem because it's like no one harvests that fruit um i know mexico city also does orange trees as well for what it's worth like an orange is about the right size like people can actually harvest that but i love yeah there's some orange trees in san jose on the, on the university campus so you can climb up and get just the most delicious fruit and like there's more than enough you know and it, you can walk home with a shirt full of oranges and it's and you're still leaving plenty for other people um, yeah i think caltech does the same uh, it's a cool concept it just has to be like integrated into a cultural practice and like they have to be used you have to be cared for like that's and if it's just like berries and stuff then yeah, no, it's got to be something more more robust. And David and I were meeting and talking about the possibility of like Golden Gate Park becoming um, kind of like the onboarding space for alternate modes of transportation and like, you know, lobbying the city to like start thinking about, you know, now that the top half of JFK is closed down for, you know, for car free space, like what if we built some other pathways, right? Like, you know, something that had a perfect grade down to the street where it was or down to the beach that was never going to be too fast. And then also it wasn't so graded, so, so steep that you couldn't push back up the top of it, right? And like that would be sort of like your your three mile testing ground, you know, to get from point A to point B and you could learn how to skateboard there or whatever else you learn how to roller skate for, for travel, right? Like there's a roller skating rink in Golden Gate Park, but it's like 400 square feet, maybe, maybe a thousand square feet, you know, but it's not like, it's not travel focused. And so like, how do you get people, you know, excited about the idea of a pathway? And if you could go from, you know, the center of San Francisco to the beach and all the while there were places to sit and lie down and you know, throw your stuff away, like, that, that to me some, becomes like the compelling case for like, you know, the orange grove where it's like, it's a central pathway. It's a, you know, um, it's somewhere with it where everybody would go and, and you could, you know, make a network of those things out from there, right? You could follow the fruit around the city. Yeah, totally. That'd be cool. I mean, yeah, you can imagine something like, what if roller skates were not so shoes off? Like what if you had roller skates that actually strapped onto your feet? Like, I do kind of love these, like the, the scooters that people just trashed everywhere. As like, we actually do have like, you know, like as a kid, I remember the city was always trying to like, we need to have more pedestrian options. And then someone finally made like a zero emission, carbon neutral, pedestrian friendly option. And everyone lost their shit. Like, this is terrible. Well, they weren't free, right? Like the Google bikes are are slightly closer, you know, but like the scooters, you have to pay to use them. and and. They're not carbon neutral because like the, the the average life of one of those scooters is six weeks. Yeah. Like, and they become e-waste so fast. I, I know somebody who knows somebody who works at Lime and like those things are, are completely fucked. Now, granted, if you made a carbon neutral skateboard, which I'm working on, or like, you know, like a circul circularly, you know, uh, manufacturable skateboard, like you wouldn't lock a skateboard. Like, you, you know, you're, you're not going to freeze the wheels or whatever. And so if they were just like, skateboards lying around you like okay cool i'm gonna grab this one and go I, I think that there's just another there's another format you know but an electric yeah. scooter any kind of electric I mean, anything can't can't be like free and available everywhere i don't think I don't probably know. not but like compared to cars it's just like at least there's no smog coming out of them yeah yeah it's, like, it's, good. it's good but there's there's upstream and downstream emissions for those things that are pretty severe um, yeah fair I mean, I guess where I was kind of going though is like, what if you just had like roller skates that would strap onto your shoes, like snowshoe style? That's a skateboard. Like, you know. <laughs> no, skateboard, skateboard's different because the skateboard's like the full plank. Whereas, like, you think about like old school roller skates where it used to be like a thing that would go on your feet. Right. Like, the style has changed where it's like now an integrated thing. But it used to be that you would have your actual shoe and you'd strap the skate on. Right, right. Like, people wanted more, like, they wanted a more solid interface, right? And so, like, you know, the, you end up with a, or maybe they just want to sell stuff. And I think it is, like, you get a better performance out of it when it's all together. Yeah, but, like, the skateboard is just, like, a roller skate platform cut in half and separated further, 
you know, like that's why it's called a skateboard is yeah, it just is a roller skate, but like extendo. Yeah. Um, but also like a lot's changed since that era. Like the bearings have gotten better and the urethane wheels have like existed. Like those 1950s roller skates sucked. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Like there, there's a lot of stuff like from those early form factors that if they were reintroduced with modern technology, we'd be better off. Like, you know, some of those, those skateboards from back in the day too, like they were a really good form factor. And then we just like decided that kickflips ruled the day and we lost a lot of the really good ideas that were, you know, embedded in those designs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like even like like it, like in San Francisco, like the streets are kind of like garbage. Um, but like having extra spacers is like a thing that it's actually hard to find. Like, like you have to like like we're just have to retool a skateboard to actually like have it nice for street riding. Oh sure, I mean yeah, go to commonskateboards.com. We 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 solve we solve some of these problems. No, it's true, but like the point is like it's not the default. Oh no, exactly. Well, and that's that's kind of our point as well, right? Like that, you know, mainstream sort of approaches to the form factor leave a lot lacking, right? Like the, you know, the Jake Phelps line is like, you know, skateboarding owes you nothing; it owes you wheel bite in the rain. And like, if I want my kid to get to school safely and come back home, like I actually don't want that for them on a skateboard. Probably not. Yeah, they're, they're kind of dangerous. Hmm. All right, I've got to run. I will, uh, Randall. I'll talk to you in a little bit. I'm going to bounce too. I got to uh, order lunch for these guys for our workshop. Yeah, same. Thanks for letting me listen in. Good stuff, you guys. Drew, your contributions have been great lately. Keep it up. Super. Yeah, fun. man. You're killing it. Thank you. Thank you. Beast <laughs> mode. Beast <laughs> mode. <laughs> it's just normal mode for Drew. Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> All right. Cheers. See you guys.